Uh, so, Alexi, Drew, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, I know our discussion is certainly very topical today. We're see we're seeing, you know, over the past few days, a number of items uh, around cyber conflict that I think have been very interesting. But I thought we'd start um, by uh, really providing an introduction to the students on what cyber uh, conflict is. We're seeing technology used uh, increasingly in warfare and terrorism and elsewhere. Uh, and I'm very interested in, uh, you know, what you see as being, uh, uh, what cyber conflict is. Well, cyber conflict is one of those wonderful phrases that can mean a huge amount of different things. Um, it means different things, not to just different um, state actors, but also different things to different institutional actors and in many cases, industrial um, private sector actors these days as well. In the state sense, cyber conflict is still broad, even narrowed down to this just particular actor, because conflict doesn't necessarily mean war, because we can have all sorts of forms of conflict which take place below this threshold of what we would say is, is traditionally understood as warfare. So, for example, the most, most recent nuance injected in the kind of social science debate around cyber conflict is that a lot of what we had previously potentially mistakenly labeled as acts of cyber warfare are better understood as acts of cyber espionage. But these are still forms of conflict between state and non-state actors. So things like the theft of intellectual property, the sabotage of industrial R&D, um, even the, in many cases, the use of blackmail to blackmail um, people who are designing R&D pieces for various governments or elsewhere. All of these are actually increasingly being incorporated into what we would call acts of cyber conflict. Now, it would only really become an act of cyber war once it passes a very, again, unfortunately, broad set of thresholds, which vary from actor to actor. But cyber warfare is a very contentious topic in my field. Um, it's long been this, this catechism, this idiom that has had a lot of weight behind it but no one has really been very clear what they mean by the concept of cyber warfare. If we mean cyber war in terms of the use of digital technologies and platforms within an existing conflict, we see plenty of examples of that already, and we have done for quite some time. Um, electronic warfare is not a new thing. It's been around for a very long period of time. It's very well entrenched within the military doctrine of the United States, Canada, European states, Russia, China, India. All of these places increasingly have fully incorporated um, cyber means into their kind of military capacity for if they're in the middle of a conflict. Now, there's also a lot of discussion of cyber conflict being something that you could potentially start a war with, and that's a different thing entirely. Can you meet that threshold with a cyber attack alone? And a lot of that rests on the concept of what kind of harm can a cyber attack cause? Because most traditional thinking around warfare and that threshold is around causing a, a, a certain amount of harm to either a human being or physical infrastructure. And there's long been discussions of is cyber, can cyber attacks actually achieve that? Now there's some very well written and um, well regarded arguments back and forth on both sides of this debate. And increasingly we're seeing that yes, cyber could, has the potential of, however yet we have not yet seen an individual, a human being killed by a cyber attack. Um, but there's a lot of um, very emotive language thrown around, particularly in well-meaning but not well-versed policy makers who use things like Cyber 9-11 and Cyber Pearl Harbor incredibly unhelpfully in this discourse, but it sounds very emotive and powerful, but it doesn't mean what they think it means, and it certainly isn't reflected in what's actually possible. So that's one of the things that a lot of my work is about trying to remove that unhelpful discourse from this kind of discussion. Very interesting in many areas that we could talk about there. Uh, and we're going to uh, with the questions that we have today. But the, the first thing then, uh, or the, 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 the first area I thought that would be useful to look at is how cyber is influencing uh, global security dynamics, how it's influencing the security re relationships between countries. Just this week, we've seen, uh, you know, items around this, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's it's an area that I think I thought you might be able to clarify. 
Yeah, it's 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 becoming it's it's adding more complexity, certainly. And part of that I think is and a lot of the things that I think are unique about cyber and how this changes the relationship between states and what we call the security dynamic is the pace, the speed, um, coupled with the the reliance upon the technologies that are at play here. Um, and the reliance of us on those technologies and us in a very broad term. Uh, in terms of the pace, the issue here is that um, most forms of attack that you might use, say, if you had cyber capacity for an offensive capacity and it was in your arsenal, it was in your doctrine, most attacks that you would have had to achieve the same goals that weren't of this type take time. Um, they're less transparent, they're potentially easier for the other side to notice and to be aware of, and you'll likely have a more transparent doctrine as to when you're going to use them, what you would target with them, and they tend to have very narrow um, ranges of effect. The problem with cyber, as we've seen, is that it's not necessarily the same here. They're faster, they're far less transparent in what they can and can't do, and as we have seen, Many instances of the actual use of offensive cyber capacity by states has resulted in, in very obvious unintended consequences and what you could call maybe splash damage, where yes, you've influenced the original target, but due to the nature of the interconnectivity and um, interoperable platforms that are being used, not just by your target, um, but by others, you've had, you've caused harm there as well as to what you targeted. So this changes a lot of things in the security dynamic. You also ha increasingly have a, a new dynamic of haves and haves nots. So we saw this in the nuclear space for quite some time. There's the nuclear states and there's the non-nuclear states. And there's a lot of argument between the two sides of you guys have these things that we by law and by treaty cannot have. And yet according to that same treaty, you're meant to help us get some of the benefits of this technology that we agree not to weaponize, but you don't, or you do selectively. And this is what we see with Iran, for example, that Iran says they want um, nuclear technology for bio and energy, but everyone else on the US particularly claims it's purely for weapons and therefore Iran can't have any. What we now see increasingly is actually there's a divide between cyber haves and have nots. And there's a great pressure on the have nots to catch up with the haves. And in the nuclear space, they can't do this because actually the, the barrier to entry to develop nuclear offensive capacity is very high in all sorts of different ways. In the cyber realm, however, in terms of developing offensive cyber capability, the barrier is much lower. You can either buy it, quite simply, because there are lots of people, um, industries, and less, well, more nefarious types who are quite willingly sell you this capability off the shelf if you want it. And you can, if you really want to, um, essentially attract the expertise that designed this very capability for your potential opponents to yourself. Um, there's a very lucrative market in knowledge transfer of cyber expertise over to Middle Eastern countries and um, East Asia. For, we'd really like to give you lots more money and we also would really like to develop our own offensive cyber capability. We can, we can make this work for both sides and that again is a dynamic that we don't really see. So it is cyber as a, a means of offensive and defensive capability is changing the security dynamic by dint of things like its pace it's the, our reliance on it on every sector of what we do from our daily lives to our security concerns and because of the relative ease of transfer and capability building that this means of destabilization or stabilization has over its predecessors so you you talked about the uh, you know, what the threshold might be that where we move from uh, cyber, uh, I guess, into cyber warfare. Uh, and this is, seems to be part of the area that you've, uh, that you work in around what's called cybersecurity norm construction. Uh, so, you know, perhaps what the parameters are, what the rules are, uh, as far as cyber conflict goes. So I, I was keen that you, you know, describe what is meant by cybersecurity norm construction and, and, and why it's important. Well, norms in this case, they, they are effectively the, rule, the rules of behavior that we, we buy into, or we don't. Um, they're not automatically things that we all and all actors involved agree on. They tend to be things that are actually contested and they become, 
accepted over time through this contestation where different sets of norms compete against each other for acceptability of those um, pushing them. And the most attractive to the larger number tends to then become the de facto accepted standard of behaviors in whatever particular thing in hand. Now, cyber is this, this issue that has been actively discussed in a normative sense for quite some time. There's been UN open-ended working groups for a couple of years, but there's been a UN group on, or UN group of governmental experts or a GGE on cyber norms since um, the 90s, I believe. And for a while, there was quite a lot of um, consensus opinion of, of what norms of cyberspace in, in a state-on-state -state interaction should look like. And a lot of it was essentially, in basic terms, translating normal state behavior and acceptable behaviors of states to other states into a digital realm. And there's very little contention. That has, in the last five, 10 years, become less and less concrete. Um, things have become more contested. We've seen um, divisions between um, what in, in the international kind of institutional arena where groups of states have begun to band together and support slightly different norms. Um, there has been more division in this space to the point that the open-ended working group was essentially created to try and get around the divisions which had cr formed in this smaller working group in the UN. And it's finding the same problems. The issue is, is that, in my personal opinion, is that this is still important because technology and norms are intrinsically connected. Um, technology and standards and ethics are intrinsically connected. You, you cannot create a technology which is separate from the standards and ethics of the individual or individuals who have created it. And that is something which is often misunderstood or not, not considered at all in the international policy space or the domestic policy space. And what is considered is economic benefit and security. And we don't actually consider the human component, the humanitarian component. And what we see now is there are increasingly powerful states who have a, a large buy-in to the technology who are through that managing to essentially gain greater hold and greater force behind the set of norms that they represent. And these norms are less focused upon humanitarian principles of transparency, openness and privacy. They're less concerned about things like stability and um, openness and ability to in to be interoperable and cooperative and they're more interested in government control centralized oversight and privacy is a is a far down the list issue and that that is causing problems um, because they have got very good at essentially working within a, a global order system like we have to get what they want and when they don't get it within the system they're more than happy to go outside of the system and that is it's difficult because we have a, a process in international institutions of working towards shared outcomes cooperatively. And as soon as you don't buy into that system, it doesn't work anymore. And that is the kind of direction that we're, we're unfortunately kind of drifting towards. And it take, it's going to take a significant effort on the behalf of everyone else to band together and go, actually, no, we need to, we need to stick the path. It's very interesting. I mean, I'm seeing this in a number of different areas where, you know, rapid technological change is causing this, uh, you know, discussion or, or this, certainly this issue with norm creation. This week we saw the ruling in the UK courts uh, around Uber and, uh, you know, with the norms that would exist in gig work. That's, that's another, yeah. uh, another area of this happening, right? Yeah, exactly that. Like there's the norms involved in technology are not just the norms of international humanitarian law about conflict. Oh. They're the norms of individual ownership of our own data, um, our right to have privacy, our right to essentially the digital transposition of our human rights into a digital space. And that that covers everything from the conflict level to our right to be um, separate as civilians from military actors within a conflict, be it cyber or kinetic, and our right to a family life, privacy, um, communications, all of this. And these are things that I, I think you're right. In many cases, again, this, this pace problem is that the technology has developed at such a pace that the 
the otherwise quite slow moving process of normative creation, normative construction, particularly at the international level, which then is meant to then become codified in law, is much slower. And it's also normally a corrective process. So normally bad things happen and then the standards kind of get measured up to it and people go, oh no, that, that doesn't work. We need to change this a little bit and, and bring it back. But when you marry that up with the pace, by the time you've realized that we've gone in the wrong direction, that we've forked at the wrong curve, it's much harder to pull it back by that point. And I think that we're, we're starting to, in some realms, do better at that. And the Uber ruling is one of those. But the fact that it got this far and this endemic, that gig working with the digital kind of bent to it has reached such a point, And we've only now really started doing anything about it. That I think is a good identifier that this is a significant problem. Absolutely. So you're, you're discussing there the civil liberties implications to a degree. Uh, of the technologies that are used in cyber conflict. And, and I was interested in, you know, what are those implications? What do you see as the things that are happening uh, with the growth of, uh, of cyber uh, uh, conflict activity that we should be concerned about and dealing with from a, a civil liberties point of view? Well, there, there are two things, I think, that, that, that are major issues, one of which I've mentioned several times already, which is privacy. Um, but the other is this division between, um, in international humanitarian, we talk about acceptable targets that, you know, military are, you can target that. Um, civilians, no, they're like general ruling, no, there are very minor exceptions, but in most cases, civilian targets of civilian infrastructure are just off the table. The problem that we find in the kind of digital space is that those infrastructures are becoming incredibly entwined. Um, that, that separating the military from the civilian is often, in often case almost impossible. If you want a context, look at solar winds, right? So this, this is not an act of cyber war, be careful. It's a cyber espionage at most, a very incredibly clever and um, important critical bit of cyber espionage, no questions. but. In this case, though, if it were, say, this, if this were an offensive act, something that was meant to be disruptive or disruptive, which it wasn't, if that were the case, the problem here that we face in the, the civil liberties component is that this is a private industry on private individuals or private companies, computers or systems that has been used and potentially misused, and, and if this was an offensive case, disrupted or destroyed, in order to carry out an act of cyber offense. Now, in, in a physical sense, if this was a kinetic conflict, that would be a very tricky case to justify under international humanitarian law because that's a civilian infrastructure. But in the cyber sense, this is, it's the perfect means of gaining access. I mean, we just need to see that the amount of access that was gained through this. Um, I, from, from memory, I cannot think of a single other piece of cyber espionage that's gained quite so much access for a single, um, single aggressor into all of these different, um, not only private companies, but government ministries in the U S and elsewhere. And I think that, that particular case study is a great example of some of the things we're seeing now. I mentioned earlier, for example, splash damage, um, in acts of cyber offense. If you look at the case of mask, um, back with, I can't remember what particular attack that was actually there's too many of them to keep track of um but this one was a an attack that was we believe attributed to russia targeting ukrainian financial system so definitely targeting ukraine um but it used it was targeting a particular piece of software but it happened to be a software that mask interacted with the large shipping company and it essentially crippled a huge amount of their network infrastructure um and they had to spend a huge amount of money replacing it from scratch. But that's a private civilian infrastructure that was unintentionally, and this is again a problem because IHL tends to be very, very clear about it's what your intent is, not what actually happens. But that's even more difficult to judge in, in, in a cyber based type of offense because your intent can be very clear, but because of the nature of the entwined interconnectivity of, of the vector of your attack, 
you it'll be very hard to be completely certain that your your intent is all that will happen and in this case it's a perfect example again of it was definitely not i very much doubt that the the gru or the russian agency responsible intended to cripple mask but they did so these are the kinds of issues that in the in the civil liberties space it's the entwining of private to public spaces in in digital means and through digital means that now make them they are the attack surface and it's no longer the attack surface and no longer in a kinetic sense a a military outpost or a warship or an airbase it's your remote access tools and it's that sort of thing and that is the problem or one of them very interesting and um, another area that you look at is what's known as algorithmic politics and uh, the impact that artificial intelligence might have there. So I, I'm interested in your explanation of what that is, but also the impact that it might have uh, on democracy. Yeah, so algorithmic politics is, is generally the assessment of how our human interaction with algorithms might shape our experience of politics, democracy, and our social interactions. And this can go from all sorts of senses. And this is actually quite difficult to explain to policymakers because when you when you say algorithms, they tend to think like, well, their their concept is it's like a full on, fully blown AI, which obviously is not um, is not the case. But what we mean is you can say everything from um, a court booking system or a through to say Twitter and social media or um, in many cases, the in fact, the algorithm that is responsible for dealing with uh, moderation on these platforms is a great example. So in, in terms of the, the issue of, of artificial intelligence here, most of it comes down to a, a matter of trust and transparency. And that's, that's actually where the field is kind of leaning to now, is that explainable and transparent AI is really the solution to the problem of, can we trust um, an artificial um, set of rules to make what we previously have done as a human decision-making process to be fair and equitable. Now, the problem that most people have had with this is not necessarily one they can explain in technical terms, but simply one of, we don't want to trust something that we don't understand. Now, the solution to that is, is effectively having transparency and explainability, and because you can't have just one. If you have transparency that allows, say, people to open the um, inquire of how the AI was designed and how it works and the code of it. That's all well and good, but your average user isn't going to understand what they're looking at. So what you need is to be able to explain how it works as well. So that's what we say transparency and explainability, because that in that sense, you build trust because you can go, you can access it. We're not hiding anything from you. And we can explain to you how each part of this works in order to be equitable. And it's also about a matter of, of essentially having diverse inputs into how these things are created, because it's very easy to lose track of our, our human biases when we're creating things and not understand how something which we view as equitable and fair and how it processes its interaction with people is only fair for us and our experience, but would not be fair if it were given the context of another person who has a different background. And there's a lot of evidence for this, particularly um, some of my most outlying but um, favorite examples that kind of are obviously awful but demonstrate the point quite well um, the xbox connect controllers that wouldn't work for black people was a fantastic example um, as is systems which do profiling based on for example previous historic um, policing data um, because if you have historical data which is based upon an already biased system and you use that to inform your uh, well, policing statistics and policing suggestions, well, it's going to be bias. And if you don't understand that, then you're essentially simply codifying a pre-existing problem. You're not solving it when, in fact, machine learning could solve it if we were more transparent and explainable and included a wide enough range of people to be involved in its design and implementation. Um, in terms of democracy, that is, in fact, one of the key reasons why it could be a problem is that democracy is meant to be an equitable and open process free and fair it's not fair if we simply use technology to bake in pre-existing unfairness that exists in our democratic systems and that's very easy to do because 
the most simple way to create an algorithm is to recreate what already exists in a codified form. And that is what a lot of our early algorithms simply did. And it's only recently that we've, we've increasingly realized that you can't just feed huge amounts of data to a machine learning set and go use this to create it. We need to police the data. And this is true and even more true in a, in a global sense. There's a reason why the Chinese have a saying where data is the new oil, because they want to create, say, for example, highly useful medical AI based upon machine learning. But if all of their data is based upon their own population, well, it can't do anything about people like us because it doesn't have our data, which is why the Chinese really like to buy and acquire as much data on everyone as they can, or one of the reasons. So there's all these things that influence potentially democracy, health, our social lives, and all because we potentially haven't been careful enough in how we've attempted to turn existing processes into algorithms or to create new algorithms to aid in those processes. And that's, that's where I leave that one. And, and, and as an, an example of that, that, uh, that I think you're referring to in terms of uh, transparency and explainability might be, I've heard of, uh, you know, algorithms and AI that might be used to determine whether a defendant would get bail in a court uh, or may even influence the sentence that they would be given was, and being transparent about that, right? Yeah, I think there was a great Wired article on that a little while ago where they actually looked, there was a particular algorithm that was designed to try and help, I think, judges in their sentencing decisions. Mm. And it was designed to inform them about the chances of recidivism, so repeated offence. And because obviously it was based upon historic trends of recidivism, which is based upon a system which is predominantly um, essentially imprisoned black and ethnic minority groups, it this algorithm predominantly suggested bail for white defendants and no bail for black defendants, which is obviously completely wrong. Um, don't get me wrong, it, it wasn't, the algorithm wasn't making a decision, it was meant to be informing the humans, it was what we'd call human in the loop. But a human is going to be influenced by that because they're going to trust the system. I mean, there is, there is then the component of how much do different people of different types and backgrounds trust information given to them by an algorithm. And that does, it's not always the same, it does vary, but it is going to play into it. And if we don't recognize that and try and realize that that's not a good way of doing it, then yeah, we, we create more problems than we're solving. Absolutely. Um, so I wanted also to talk about disinformation and its use in cyber conflict. We seem to have seen a lot of that over the last few years. Um, so could you talk about the impact of that uh, and also, I was interested that you had supported a call Emmanuel Macron had made for a European agency to uh, work on, on disinformation. Uh, so I, I thought you might, uh, you know, explain why you thought that would be worth having. Yeah, gladly. So disinformation, in, in terms of cyber, I take a relatively um, broad definition of how I, I would view or describe cyber security issues in my field. And I include disinformation in that because I, I feel that it has a significant technical component to the point that if it weren't for the kinds of technical platforms, it, it would be propaganda, the old school concept of it. So it's, it's distinct enough, I think, to be different. And it's become increasingly my bread and butter in my actual research. In terms of the impact, I, I think I would argue that there are very few things or very few single threats that you could point to that have larger potential for harm to, well, everyone, quite frankly. Um, yes, there are bigger ones. I'd say like environmental threat is, is endemic and is massive and is, is definitely further up there. But the risk to our, our global information space and our trust in that and our ability to trust what information is given to us, particularly when it's married to our dependence upon that digital information space for information of all types, be it political, medical, scientific, or otherwise. That I think is one of the biggest threats out there to us. And disinformation is no longer something that is simply done by one or two states. It is something which has become, is proliferated to the point where it is increasingly becoming 
a standard tool for a vast array of states. And we're talking Russian, Chinese, African nations, Indonesian, the lot. Um, they're everywhere. We're also seeing businesses do it. Disinformation for hire is a thing. Um, you can hire out um, people to essentially run disinformation campaigns on social media platforms if you're a politician to try and help you win an election. And that is something that is endemic and is problematic because it interacts with a lot of these other things we've already discussed. So if we talk about algorithms, for example, the, the algorithms that decide our marketing platforms and, and um, personalized marketing and media, that can be manipulated if you understand how they work. And that's what a lot of these companies actually do. And that is critically important. And in terms of why I, I supported, um, I supported the broad strokes of Macron's um, discussion. I don't think his his direct plan was, was workable, but I, I think what I do agree with is that this is not an issue that an individual state can solve. This is not a, the United Kingdom recognizes disinformation as a risk we're going to do this, we've solved this information. No, you wouldn't even solve it just for the UK because there are so many different sources and routes that that can reach your particular person. So what I think is actually, he's right in saying that it needs a, a broader regional or institutional, international institutional response. The problem that he comes in face with, even within the European context, which is what I wrote in that article, is that Europe is, a, is not a monolith. There, there is still significant variance in how different European states view the role of the state with regards to providing sources of information and judging veracity and legitimacy of sources of information. So saying that there'd be a state mandated kind of this is true and this is not, that is not going to fly pretty much anywhere in Europe. But there are different sources of legitimacy, trusted legitimacy in every European state that could, if brought together, provide a, a means of um, engaging with disinformation, either strategically through trying to counter narratives or simply by creating better transparency of what is going on and informing the public of better skills to be aware and critical of the information that is fed to them. And I don't think, again, that's, that's not something that just the state can do. So my, my general support for him is actually we need a we need a broader consensus. And there is there are groups like EU um, versus Disinfo, which I think comes out of the European External Action Service that does this sort of thing. NATO does strategic communications to assess disinformation targeting the alliance. The Baltic states have a shared effort in this kind of thing as well. Estonia and Latvia in particular. The Nordic states have long developed a kind of shared agreement on how they deal with this information between them. There's lots of people and groups that we could learn from, but we just need to actually get on and do that. Yeah, you seem to be saying that the approach to uh, dealing with mis disinformation isn't simply about trying to control it. It's also about, uh, you know, educating the public in, in how to uh, deal with it themselves. Yeah, I, I think our, our biggest our biggest and most historic failing is the kind of moving away from teaching critical understanding of media for our students. And I mean, I, I've taught a lot in the UK and I, I did um, tutoring for A-level students as well. And one of the things that I, I recognize then just as much as when I was, I was that student is that we generally teach students to regurgitate information and facts, not question them. And that is a failing. That's a mistake. Because if you teach students simply to regurgitate factual data that they find, what happens when they're fed facts and that aren't accurate? Um, they're not going to critique them. They're not going to have the, the wherewithal or the basic understandings of how to measure the veracity of, of data that's fed to them or question it. Like it and I, I mean, there's, there's a lie from Benjamin Disraeli that I really love, which is that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I don't think there's there's a better phrase to put this, is that if you want to, um, for the uninitiated, statistics can say whatever you want. Um, but what we don't do is we don't teach students of any level to actually engage with query and statistics as they're given to them. Very important. And uh, I had an interesting discussion with someone from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at uh, 
Arizona State University a few months ago. And, uh, and part of her job was to do this and, and to develop programs that would help to, uh, to counter misinformation in schools and elsewhere. And, uh, you know, that was a very interesting discussion, but was similar, uh, had a similar focus to what we're talking about here. Uh, and also uh, similar to this, uh, or, you know, further on this, uh, is the impact that social media is having. We talk about social media creating uh, polarization and, uh, and and contributing in all sorts of ways to increased conflict. Um, could you, uh, to what extent do you think social media ha has contributed to global conflict? So I, I think that we've not reached the point where where social media can start a war. Um, I did a I did a paper as my first postdoc actually on um, the role of essentially Twitter in conflict escalation, and our general conclusion, my, me and my co-author in that piece, was that Twitter can't start a conflict, but what Twitter can do is make escalation in an existing conflict more likely, and and our reasoning behind this was actually quite complex, but it can be broken down simply into issues of miscommunication and, and a lack of clarity, really. So if, if you go back to how during a crisis, um, diplomacy is normally designed to send very specific um, messages and signals between the parties of a conflict, be those directly involved and those potentially attempting to mediate. Now, when you would do this, you would you know what you were trying to say, you know the message or signal you were trying to send, whether it be escalatory, de-escalatory or kind of somewhere in the middle, you would most likely know personally the person that you were sending this message to, be it the your opposite member in a, a, diplom a, dipl a, dipl a diplomatic mission, or be it the actual head of state themselves. And you would know how they would likely interpret whatever message you would write. You'd also potentially be able to write quite a lot. So you could be very careful in how you sent this message. Now, in a social media sense, when we bring Twitter in and Twitter diplomacy, which we increasingly see in some states, to be careful to point that, that the use of Twitter in this sense is not global. It's actually heavily focused around those that have very mature social media audiences. So the US in particular is a, is a focal point of this, particularly under the Trump administration, um, obviously. But what you then get is you get one, this pace component comes in again. So the speed of things rapidly increases, which creates a, a greater chance of miscommunication, miscalculation. You then have a limited space. You have 240 characters or 280 characters in which to write this, this thing, unless you write a thread, which Trump did quite a lot, to be fair. Um, and you have another component, whereas now when you're tweeting out to everyone, your many millions of followers if you're head of state. You're not just messaging directly to the person who you're trying to send the signal to. You're actually messaging to a vast audience of domestic people and foreign people. And some of those are going to act as intermediaries to your message. And they're essentially going to retranslate what you've said to potentially your intended audience. So you're even less sure of what message is actually going to reach where it's going. So this is bad in normal diplomacy. If you take this in the middle of, say, an actual kinetic crisis between one of our case studies was the US and Iran during the Iranian missile strike on a US air base in Iraq, um, the killing of General Soleimani, that is, that is a big risk to add further chances of miscalculation. And that, that for me, is, is an example of as social media matures increasingly as a, a means of diplomatic communication, it increases the chance of miscommunication in the midst of a crisis that could lead to unintended, unintended consequences. And it, it becomes much harder to be clear. Some politicians in their official roles only tweet um, to their domestic audiences. So their messages are all like bluster and power and America is great or Canada is great. Or the United Kingdom is amazing. And if you read that as a foreign audience, say you, you read that as the Chinese, that doesn't look great for your diplomatic relations, but you need to try and work out, are they messaging me or are they messaging their, their voter base? And sometimes it's not clear. Again, so there are all manners of dynamics 
of this type of interaction, which means that signaling becomes almost impossible to be certain of. And again, as time goes by, it's likely that this form of diplomacy, social media or Twitter diplomacy is the kind of idiom that's developed, becomes more commonplace. So this risk, this lack of surety in messaging is only going to increase. Very interesting. I mean, I you, you might hope that there would be a, uh, that things would move to a point where norms were established and, you know, clarity might be greater uh, in these things. But, uh, but certainly the confusion that you're describing uh, or the lack of clarity that you're describing is, uh, it seems to be something that is that we should be concerned about. Okay, uh, I also wanted to look at, we're covering a lot of areas here and, uh, and, and it's very fascinating. I'm interested too in the relationship between cyber warfare and other warfare formats. This week we saw, I saw a report about Trident missiles being used in relation to cyber uh, attacks and yeah. this, uh, I, I, I didn't, follow it closely, uh, but basically the relationship between uh, cyber warfare and other forms of warfare today, uh, how would you uh, describe that? Yeah, so I'll start with that one because that, that comes out of the British um, United Government's Integrated Defence Spending Review, which has just been released, um, the first half of it, because it's coming in two parts this time. Um, it's 114 pages, which I've only read through once so far, but I'm sure I'll become well acquainted with it. But that particular section did gain quite a lot of notoriety in the press um, and I think unintended notoriety and it's a misreading. So there's a section essentially in the bit talking about Britain's nuclear strategy where they were essentially trying to justify the increasing of their, their warhead um, holdings, which is against the general trend where the UK has been going for quite some time. And one of the justifications they give is that there's an increasing probability of um, emerging technologies, including cyber, but they listed a generic group of being able to develop a capacity for a, a, a type of attack relatively of a, a relative size to a nuclear attack. So they're talking about you could, we can foresee the instance where in an un, unordained amount of time, a non-nuclear attack could cause damage and harm to the same extent of a nuclear attack. And that's how they're essentially justifying, we reckon we need to have more, more warheads. There's a sentence that comes after that, that is, I think the reason why this is, this has become highlighted is the UK saying that they're willing to use nukes to respond to cyber attacks, because they then go on to say, we will continue to consider this, um, our response to these forms of attack with nuke in terms of nuclear in going forwards. Now, they are not saying that from now on, the UK considers it legitimate to use a nuclear warhead to respond to a cyber attack of significant harm. It's not what they're saying. The UK, generally speaking, has a, a as a form of deterrence of what we has what we call ambiguity over what their actual response to these sorts of things are. Their thinking is that if they refuse to make it completely clear where the threshold for a nuclear response is, it's more likely that their aggressors will not risk unintentionally going over that threshold, because if you don't know it, you have to assume it's very low because the worst case scenario is you get that wrong and then you then get a Trident missile fired at you. So the ambiguity is, in a, in a, is a way of increasing the deterrent posture. Now, that obviously answers the question that no, the UK is not saying cyber is now a legitimate thing that we respond with nuclear warhead. Now, in terms of how cyber fits into other forms of conflict, there's two ways of thinking about this. Um, where does it rank in terms of priority and usage? So in terms of ranking, I think it's increasingly apparent that um, the UK, much like the US and other like highly advanced warfighting nations, is realizing that cyber is not necessarily a standalone technology. It's an interconnectable one. It's one which essentially sockets into every other form of military domain. Um, the, the cyber domain term and terminology is actually unhelpful because it makes it seem like it's a separate entity that it's completely standalone whereas in reality cyber plays into naval warfare aerial warfare land warfare etc so it, 
yes, there are standalone components, but the majority of the stuff is actually connected to the others. Uh, what that means in terms of posture is that there's a lot of discussion of when you're trying to send these physical signals in, in periods of crisis or your doctrine, your military doctrine, where do you put cyber in terms of response? Is it something that you do prior to kinetic as a, as a way of, look, we're not going to do too much harm, but we're going to use a cyber attack to demonstrate where our line in the sand is? Or do you do it alongside kinetic operations? Or do you do it as a precursor directly beforehand? And these are strategies that different states have made clear. So the Russians have commonly used cyber alongside kinetic activities or as a direct precursor to. Um, the Americans have actually seemingly got it directly in their doctrine that they will use cyber as a, as a standalone entity beforehand and then potentially go further. The UK has never made it clear. Um, and I think that, again, plays into this ambiguity point. I think the UK is preferentially leaning towards the fact that we will use it as and when we feel appropriate. There's no set um, point or direction in which we will. We will simply use it all the time. Um, and I, I think they're more, more reflective in that sense. But it is most common that we see militaries now actually using cyber in concert with other attacks. One of my favorites to use is actually relatively old now but it was an Israeli attack on a Syrian nuclear enrichment plant where they used an e-warfare platform, I think on an F-16, to disable the um, Syrian air defense network as they flew over to actually take out a nuclear enrichment plant. And that's a great example of a e-warfare, um, cyber warfare, or cyber attack, to take out a military infrastructure to enable a kinetic attack. And that's the kind of thing that we're actually seeing more and more disruptive um, use during... Um, during conflict. And that's what we would mean presumably by hybrid warfare. That's what that term would refer to. Well, that, that's a difficult one because the way hybrid warfare tends to get used in, in multiple different ways. So hybrid warfare can mean, yeah, you, you have a hybrid between different domains. So arguably like a full out campaign will use all domains of warfare all at once. That's what the Americans are good at. Um, but hybrid warfare in the context of cyber tends to actually mean trying to achieve the goals of warfare so klaus Witzian terms of you know dictating terms to my opponent but doing so by while maintaining yourself below the threshold of of warfare so we, we it's kind of like gray zone conflict is another way of talking about it is that we're trying to these actors are trying to use cyber as a means to gain advantage and position that you would normally be able to get through kinetic means while using cyber because their view is that it doesn't peak its head above the parapet enough to escalate into a, an actual full-blown conflict. And there's a lot of discussion in the, in the UK military that this is what the Russians have been doing or this is their general doctrine. Um, there's a lot of poor thinking, quite frankly, on this. A lot of people who don't actually have enough of understanding how the Russian military works, saying that this is their whole thing. Um, it's internally developed, whereas the Russians would say, actually, you know, we're, we're doing what we think you've done to us for 40 years. We're just turning it back the other way around. Sorry, not. And I think, that, you know, that's, so that's hybrid warfare. It's trying to keep them below the threshold and gain military or, or economic or social advantage without peeking into to actual open conflict. Does, I mean, I, I'm, I'm intrigued to, and maybe there's no answer to this question, but does this suggest that the level of conflict between nations is in some way greater now and likely to continue at a greater level? I don't know how you compare necessarily, but, you know, is, is, is are we likely to have a more turbulent era coming up? Yeah, so the, it's a contentious question in my field because it, it mainly because it is difficult to measure. It's it's quite frankly because this is very much firmly in the cyber espionage space. And espionage by its definition is not something that academics get to go and poke a stick at and get all the data about. So we, we it's very hard to, to make a clear statement on that. And we tend to have to feel around the edges of things and, and get as close as we can to the conclusion of it. And I mean, my take is that states have always been in conflict in a hybrid space forever if you go if you take the disinformation 
for example, Radio Free Europe broadcasting into the Soviet Union for everyone. That's that's disinformation in a different technological epoch. The problem that we see now is that actually we I think that some of the technologies we have, have become normalized and standardized and and heavily up, taken up mean that that level of continuous conflict between states and the espionage and hybrid level is a lot easier to do. Um, it's a lot easier to do for more actors. So it's not just Russia and the US and NATO anymore. It's it's a whole gamut of, of individuals and state and private actors as well. And it's also, I think, becoming something that um, the ambiguity component in this case actually potentially isn't helpful because what you've seen is, in, in my opinion, and again, this is hard to quantify, but from my perspective, it appears that we have seen this this rolling forward within this grey zone of where the line is, this ambiguous line in the sand of where is too far. And because it's been, been easier to get into the space and do this kind of thing, that line is being pushed further and further and further and the grey zone, this hybrid area is being expanded as we go. And I think that there are two things that might happen. Either someone completely misjudges the calculus and goes far too far and we see a response. Or that grey zone becomes so all-encompassing that we're de facto actually involved in a continuous conflict that just doesn't quite trip over into a response because no one can quite justify mm. it. Mm. And, and that is, again, not a helpful position for global stability. No, no, I mean, fascinating question, really. And uh, uh, I guess... We're, we're early on in this process and things will, uh, you know, it's it's an area that will continue to develop, but uh, it has all sorts of fascinating questions. I just got two more uh, areas that I wanted to cover quickly. Um, lethal autonomous weapons systems, we've heard a lot of talk about those. Uh, can they be controlled? What should we do about them? That That is a big question. Um... So th this has been a long ongoing discussion in, in international institutions and in academia. And I should also point out in civil society groups because it's you've actually seen a significant, um, not retasking, but taking up of, of the, the shield, as it were, by the groups that were involved, heavily involved in nuclear non-proliferation debates who have taken up um, armed robotics, or in this case, what they called killer robots is their, their particular terminology. And I think they've done some very good work. I also think potentially the problem is that they, their polemic perhaps does more harm in many cases than good. So don't get me wrong, I, I, I am not on the fence about how the concept of a, an, an artificial intelligence as more scientific sense, because we're nowhere near there at that point, with the capacity to take human life. I, I do not think that is a good idea, mainly for ethical reasons, I'll be completely honest, as it, it, it seems to me that it should not be something that is abstracted outside of a human decision making. And that would be, in terms of the philosophy of war and conflict, that would be the ultimate kind of removal of what it is to be human from what is fundamentally, but a, unfortunately, a very human activity. And it would, there are those who argue that you could you could justify this, that you could say that the decision to deploy such a system, and this is obviously still science fiction because we don't have a general AI, um, much as my many policymaker friends insist we're almost there, but they don't know the science. Um, even if we were to reach that point, they would argue that, you know, the decision to deploy it, the context in which it's deployed, the 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 standing orders that it's given in terms to set its its boundaries, that would be sufficient to inject the human into the usage of this technology. I'm not convinced um, because I think ethically, fundamentally, the decision to take a human life should rest with the human, not, not a machine. However, I'm also of the opinion that there are many decisions and activities that do take place in warfare that could be made better with a greater connectivity and usage of an algorithmic information and algorithmic um, efforts. Um, so human in the loop as a system, it's worked before, it can still work. And I think a lot of defensive technologies could benefit significantly from the speed and accuracy deployed by, um, well, 
algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence of different types. But it's a very complex debate and it's an incredibly emotive one. Um, arms control doesn't normally get emotive. There's only two, there's only two places where arms control becomes emotive. Nuclear, because it's a long running, highly contentious issue and relatively recently in, in robotics and lethal autonomy. And I think in many cases, neither of these debates have benefited from the emoticism injected into them by this decision. There are, there's no, an all out ban is not helpful. Um, quite frankly, there are already plenty of examples of um, forms of autonomy used in military systems that have lethality attached to them. Um, if you look um, recently, for example, um, loitering munitions were used in conflicts in um, um, Yugoslavia, not Yugoslavia, um, God, I've forgotten the area, but recent conflict in the kind of that particular geographical area for the first time, Israeli and Saudi designed two different types, I believe, were both used. And that has a level of autonomy involved. So there is a component of an algorithm making the decision to take a human life. We can't put that back in the box. That's there. It's gone. It's been sold. It's been deployed. And when it comes to governance, it's very difficult to revert the standards, particularly when you have technologies which are less clear in the division between civilian and military usage. And algorithms and code, the perfect example of that, right? You can't hold up a piece of machine learning in, say, computer vision and go, this is purely civilian or this is purely military. There's no tick box that fits that. Whereas in the old days of um, export controls, you could go, this explodes, this does not. We will control the thing that explodes and the thing that doesn't. That doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't work any, in, in, in the algorithm space, it works far less than any other. So there's a lot of complexity here and I don't think there's enough efforts to kind of find the middle space. There's a lot of effort to find and justify the two extremes of the position. Very interesting. I mean, the, the, the whole, what, what you're opening up there in the discussion is the whole area of arms control in the cyber era, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 we, uh, and how that might take place. And I, I'm, I'm not really going to go down that road. That, that We could talk about that, I guess, for quite a while. But, it, but the fact that there is uh, uncertainty that we're dealing with new territory there is... Uh, uh, it is really very interesting, suggests the extent of the change that cyber is bringing about as far as, uh, you know, modern warfare is concerned. Very much so. It, it's, it's fundamentally, it's these kinds of technologies, the ones that arms control people put in this bucket of emerging tech. And now those of us in the field that know most of this is not emerging, it's been around for quite some time, mm. but they like, they like these terms what what we can see is they, they they fundamentally undermine some of the core pillars of how arms control has been done because you you can't just create a green or a red list anymore about these technologies because these technologies are fundamentally should be on both and that doesn't work for the purposes of arms control and you can't create standard rules you have to actually start doing things on a case-by-case -case basis and in the context of how they might be used each time and that becomes very impractical and arms control is all about the practicalities you can't create a, a perfect system because it won't work it has to be it has to be deployable and that is that's difficult to do okay one last question uh, you've been very generous with your time and i, I found the discussion you know, you know fascinating but the, uh, the the other area i wanted to touch on is, is the question of huawei and china uh, and uh, you know there has been concern about the uh, the use of Huawei technology in the West and other country and other parts of the world. Uh, and I just wanted to get your take on that should, from a security point of view. Uh, should we be concerned about Huawei? So it it's, it depends on how you define security. Uh, it depends on the level of risk aversity um, that any individual actor or state is willing to take on. Now, I, I would define security in a relatively broad sense if I was talking about this question. And I've, I've done a lot of work on Huawei in the UK and a broader context. In fact, uh, 
Yeah, um, probably too much work, if I'm entirely honest. And for me, security actually has to encompass the kind of the the democratic principles that you represent, the the norms again. And I, I think it's very difficult in this case to separate Huawei from what it, what it does in, say, the UK or Europe when you provide your 5G technology from what that same technology and the R&D budget used to develop it is being used for within China and elsewhere. And it's not just Huawei, it, it's, it's, we, all, we don't often pick on them because they're the, the case study that we've all heard of, but you could say the same for um, Baidu, Weibo, um, Hikvision, all of these companies that if you, and I think it, I personally, if I were given free reign over the FCDO, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, I would say that if we are to allow um, these companies into our infrastructure, there should be standards that they need to meet, not just technological and security standards, which I'd also argue Huawei doesn't often meet or hasn't demonstrated to meet so far, but normative ones. And they've definitely not met those. And I and the question of whether Huawei is in effect an arm of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, as as a, a friend of mine who has far more experience of the CCP than I do, having been a diplomat there for quite some time, um, his argument generally is that they they are not the CCP. But if the CCP tells them to do something, they will do it because they have no option. It's, and for me, if taking the other side, a more traditional side of security, should we be comfortable with a market that is so undiverse that a company that has that level of responsibility to a hostile state or potentially hostile state, one which has made no, no um, qualms in hiding its, its goals, should we allow that to dominate our very non-diverse market? No, quite frankly. Um, and yeah, I've, I've made that clear in all sorts of forums before, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult one to get across in many cases because it's a contentious one. Um, but I think this is, should be a standard that we apply to all technologies, no matter its source, China or otherwise, is that, and this comes back to my much earlier point is that China, well, the technology and norms and ethics are not separate. They are one and the same thing. If you. If you accept a technology as as a part of your market, particularly a fundamental part of your market and your your infrastructure, you accept everything that that technology is used for, and you you give it your support by doing that without questioning. And if that technology is being used to provide policing for you, but authoritarian repression somewhere else in the world, you are tacitly supporting that. And I think that is not something we should be doing. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, okay, so thank you for uh, talking with me, Alexi. I'd like to ask one final thing, which is uh, the people who are watching this will be graduating soon. Uh, you graduated a little while ago. Um, and so you may have some lessons that you've learned so far that you'd like to leave them with uh, really about... Uh, anything we've talked about or anything else that you might like to share with them? Well, I, I think the biggest thing that I would suggest for anyone who is, is leaving an academic um, kind of teaching or, or learning position of any type is that be, be open with where you might want to go. Don't, don't limit yourself into a particular bucket. I always continued that I was, or <laughs> I always believed that I'd obviously go into a normal academic career that I'd, publish academic journals, that I would become a lecturer, and then that would be it. And instead what I found is the more I followed the kind of thing I found interesting, the more I found myself doing policy work. And in fact, I don't write academic journals, I write policy papers and op-eds, and I have meetings with people who, and I try and convince them from an academic perspective of good policy. And that's a very different skill, but I think that if I had stuck with the, the limits on what I wanted to do that I'd set for myself, towards the end of my doctorate, I would, have, I would have probably struggled because it's not actually what I enjoy doing. So I, my, my biggest piece of advice is don't, don't pre put yourself in a particular bucket. Allow yourself to kind of 
consider your options and a wide variety of them and find what actually suits the kind of work and impact you want to have and then pursue that. Very good advice. And uh, uh, thank you again for talking to me, Alexi. I feel very fortunate to get access to your expertise. Your knowledge in this area uh, is uh, probably unique. I, I don't know, but probably unique. Uh, and, uh, and but very valuable in understanding the impact that cyber warfare and cyber weapons, cyber conflict uh, will have on the world. And uh, uh, so thank you again for doing it. Oh, thank you, Peter, for inviting me. I hope that my answers to some of your questions are helpful for you and your students.